Welcome, everybody. It's 5.30. We're going to begin as we are streaming live over the internet, and there are people all around the country uh, dialing in to watch us from home. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to our nation's capital to participate in the 2015 EMS on the Hill Day. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'm Chuck Kearns, the president of the National Association of EMTs. And I sincerely thank each of you for making the special effort to be with us here in DC, and more importantly, to advocate for our profession and our patients. I also welcome the EMS professionals from around the country who are joining us tonight via the internet. From its inception, the purpose of EMS on the Hill Day has been to educate our congressional leaders and their staff on what EMS is, our role in the healthcare system as an important part of emergency care and national preparedness, and our evolving role in pre, post, and preventive patient care. Two, help members of Congress understand the challenges we face in delivering quality care to our patients and how Congress can help us. Three, present a unified voice with a consistent message to our congressional leaders on what kind of support we need from them, and for an event that is open to everyone in EMS and includes representation from all sectors of the EMS community. Advocacy isn't easy, but it does work. Whether advocating for funding with our local elected leaders, appropriate laws, and funding in our state capitals, or discussing our needs with lawmakers in Washington. The common thread is that it works when we present a consistent message and apply consistent pressure. Success in advocacy is not achieved in days, weeks, or months, but most often in years. So this is a journey we're on together. EMS on the Hill Day is an essential part of our ad advocacy, but it cannot be the only part. We must be persistent in advocating at home in our local communities and within our states to reinforce with our elected leaders at all levels of the legislative support we need from them for our patients. And we must encourage everyone within our profession to advocate with us. Advocacy is our shared responsibility across our industry. So please don't make this event your one advocacy task for the year. Make it part of your routine to educate those who are elected to represent your interests. Visit your members of Congress in their district offices back home. Get to know their staffers. Send emails to them. Use the online legislative service that NAEMT has on our website. It's open to everyone not just our members. And please accept our thanks and gratitude for all of your efforts throughout the year. While any EMT hosts CMS on the Hill Day, we are very grateful for the support that we receive from our sponsors. We deeply appreciate your contributions on behalf of EMS. I invite all representatives to stand when your organization name is called so we can recognize you. Please hold applause until all the companies have been recognized. Our champion sponsors, Stryker and EMS World. Please stand. Okay, that, that whole thing about hold the applause until I... <laughs> Our principal sponsors, Braun Industries. Please stand. Anyone from Braun? Well, we thank you for the support. Our pillar sponsors, the American College of Emergency Physicians, 
511 Tactical, GEMS, Jones and Bartlett Learning, Markel Services, MSI. Our steward sponsors, the American Heart Association, the American Red Cross, the Coalition Against Bigger Trucks, and our friends at OnStar. I thought, there's OnStar right over there. Hi, Kathy. Our advocate sponsors, Digitech Computers, Inc., Gold Cross Mayo, Holland and Knight, National Association of EMS Educators, the National Association of EMS Physicians, the National Association of State EMS Officials, and Physio Control. Friends of EMS on the Hill Day include the College Network, EM EVS Limited, Medic CE, and Paige Wolfberg and Worth. Thank you to all of our sponsors. <laughs> Next on the agenda is Pam Lane. She's NAEMT's Executive Director, and she will walk you through all the materials that you received at registration in your packages. Pam? Thanks, Chuck. And I would like to also invite Melissa Trumbull, Crimson Consulting. She, she, she might be outside, so we'll probably just, if she could just, great. So what we want to do uh, this is kind of walk you through all the materials, because we know we've given you a lot. And so we want to make sure that you know everything that we've given you and how you're going to be using it. So um, why don't you take out one of the leave behind kits. They're in the white folders. So every attendee here has gotten three of these. So um, we're pretty sure that you'll have enough of these leave behind kits to give to your members of Congress and to um, their, their staff. But in the event that your delegation runs out, we do have some extras. And um, Lori from Crimson Consulting will have them available in the Longworth Cafeteria Annex um, she'll be talking a little bit more about that, where her contact, where our contact point is going to be um, um, on Capitol Hill, and we will have a, a few extras. But hopefully, I think you'll you'll find that you have enough to go around. So, what's in the leave behind kits? Okay, so we've got the three requests to Congress, and they include not only what what we're asking for, but also the contact information for. Um, uh, the staff people in each of the sponsors offices um, so so it really allows you know if, if you have a, a congressman or a senator who's interested or their staff is interested this is the contact information that's on each of the requests um, we've also given each in each of these leave behind kits a copy of the um, MIHCP report um, that we talked about at the MIH summit this is a supplement to the May issue of EMS World, um, but we thought it was so important to include it in these leave behind because one of the major components of the field EMS bill is a whole section on innovation. And this report really talks in detail about that kind of in innovation, mobile integrated healthcare and community paramedicine. And it's gonna be a great report to reference when you speak to your congressional leaders. So they're gonna get a copy of that. And the other item is just a general flyer about EMS. Um, you know, most of the congressional leaders and their staff will have some general knowledge about EMS. Some of them might not, and this is a great reference tool just to give them a general overview about what it is that we do and in the profession. And now, if you can just um, take a look at your attendee packet. Okay, this is the dark teal got a little bit more information. It has a copy of the request to Congress, and everybody should have received um, an email about two weeks ago 
with um, links to the request to Congress and the talking points, and I hope that you've had a chance to take a look at those, but they're here again for you. You've got the requests, and you've got the talking points. are really important because these are on what to say about each of the requests to Congress. Um, one of the things I really want to point out to you is this, this infographic. This is a great document that we've created that encapsulates all the key points in the field EMS bill. Um, so it's great for you to use as a reference. And we have put some extra copies. It was not originally included in the um, Leave Behind kits, but we have enough copies on each of the tables. So please insert these into the Leave Behind kits because we also think this is a great reference for um, congressional leaders and their staff to be able to really easily see what's in the field bill. Um, there are also the requests and the talking points for our other two asked to Congress this year. Um, in addition to the um, briefing program, which is included in your attendee packet, we've also given each one of our attendees a copy of the MIHCP report. Um, this is a supplement to EMS World and um, if for the May issue, and so it's being mailed out now. Um, so if you get a copy of EMS World, um, you'll be getting this. And if you don't, um, we encourage you to um, uh, sign up for a subscription. Um, all um, NAMT members um, can get access to a free subscription to EMS World. And if Scott Cravens is in the room, I just sold EMS World, okay? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, so, um, other items in the kit that you will definitely want to take a look at. We have given you a map of Capitol Hill, and it kind of gives you a point of reference where the House offices are, the Senate offices, um, you know, Capitol Hill and, and the Washington Monument. So you really get a, a, a sense of where you are. Um, and then on the flip side is a map of the Metro. So, and I know for some of you it might be intimidating to get on the metro, it is for me too. So we actually have the instructions on how to use the metro to get from the hotel to Capitol Hill. And Melissa will be talking a little bit more about that. She's a local and uses the metro all the time. It's pretty easy once you get used to it. So we do have the instructions for you. And lastly, what's in the kit is information about membership in NAEMT. So this, um, EMS on the Hill Day is something that NAEMT has done um, now for six years. And um, we have always said that this is not an, an, uh, an event that is for NAEMT members. It is for everybody in EMS. Everybody in EMS from every delivery model is welcome and encouraged to attend. You are the most passionate, active people in our profession. And those are the kind of people that NAMT wants and, and would really welcome in, into our association. So please take a look at this, these flyers on individual membership and agency membership. And if you're not a current member, please consider being one. We would, we would love to have you as members of NAMT. Um, I now want to bring Melissa Trumbull, who is NAEMT's um, industry relations manager. She's also uh, local to the area. She's gonna give you some tips on what to see and do, good restaurants, places to go, and some other information. Melissa? Thank you, Pam. Welcome everybody to Crystal City, Virginia. Crystal City, Virginia was occupied by many military um, outfits and currently is occupied by DOD contractors who work out of the Pentagon. There are tons of great places to eat, to visit, and have fun in the immediate area. But let's review the most important item, how to get to the metro. You have three options. You can walk, so you can exit the hotel, you can travel north on South Clark Street, you walk about five blocks, and you will come on to 18th Street, where you will see the big M for the metro sign. From there, you take the escalator down to the station, and then you can utilize the metro. You can also travel underground here in Crystal City. If you exit the hotel and you walk across and travel east on 23rd Street. You can cross Knoll and you will enter into the Crystal City Underground Shops. From there, you can walk to the 18th Street exit and you can access the Crystal City Metro Station from underground. 
or easily you can take the hotel shuttle. Just go downstairs um, and speak with a hotel reservation desk and arrange for the van to drop you off at the metro. So e three easy ways to get to the metro from here. And with the metro trains, some of the things that you need to make as a point of reference is the routes of the trains are indicated by a color. And you will see those on your maps as well as the name of the last stop on that color line. So you want to travel and everything is indicated by the color and the name of that last stop. All of these things are in your participant kit and before boarding just make sure you double check the line color of the train and the station at the end of that line. There's also maps in every station as well as on every train. And it's easy, if you make a mistake, it's easy to get off and get back on and go the other way. Meals. Crystal City has a variety of different foods. I think I've eaten them all here. Um, and they cater to all nationalities. There are many options surrounding the hotel along the 23rd Street and all along Crystal Drive, which if you exit the hotel, you go east on 23rd, it runs parallel with South Clark and there's tons of food there as well. The Pentagon City Mall and Pentagon Row, which is about 10 blocks from here, if you walked on a straight diagonal and went through a couple buildings, you would, you would hit the Pentagon City Mall, um, offers a, additional meal options that you can utilize. Crystal City has something for everyone to offer and the hotel concierge is happy to answer any questions that you have. I will tell you that my favorite place here is Crystal City Sports Pub and it's just across the street and it's got great food, great um, televisions and lots of things to do. Places to visit. Just a short distance from here you have the Arlington Cemetery, the honored resting place of our fallen military the Pentagon, our nation's headquarters for defense, the Air Force Memorial and the 9-11 Pentagon Memorial, the historic Old Town Alexandra, Alexandria and Potomac River waterfront, and then across the bridge you have the White House, the Smithsonian, and other known museums and monuments that help define our nation. If you're, in, if you're interested in doing some shopping, um, you can utilize the underground uh, Crystal City shops or Pentagon City or Pentagon Row. And you can also, there's a movie theater just down the street um, south of here. If you have any questions, feel free to ask any NAMT staff member or hotel staff. Now I'm going to change the uh, mic off to Lori Bendel from Crimson Consulting. We are so excited that you're here, um, and myself and my colleague Chris Corbin, who I think is still outside right now, um, put together all your hill schedules. So it's uh, a big maze of um, doing Sudoku with people and trying to schedule. We have over 260 meetings scheduled on the hill tomorrow. So thank you very much for, for being here. So. And just so you know, Chris and I both actually have a connection. We're both EMS providers ourselves. So I am on the volunteer side, and he's a lieutenant with his fire department and uh, paramedic with them. So it, it's a client that is fun for us to work on, that we care about the issues, and we like working with them. So thank you for letting us be a part of it again this year. Um, so I talked about we have 40 states represented, over 260 meetings scheduled for tomorrow. So that's great. So you're really going to make an impact on the Hill tomorrow. Um, you're assigned to a team with other members from your state. So this year our focus was a little bit different, not just on visiting your home representatives, but trying to meet with the members of Congress, Congress that have jurisdiction over the field EMS bill. Okay? So you're going to be meeting with people in leadership, House Energy and Commerce Committee, House Ways and Means Committee, Senate Finance, and the Senate Health Education, Education Labor and Pensions Committee. This will be noted on your schedule. You will see, see it at the bottom of that particular meeting if you're meeting one, with one of those individuals. So as the field EMS bill moves through, and Pam and Lisa and the team will talk more about that, but you're gonna be, these are the members that actually will be looking at this bill first. So these are a great place for us to be having the meetings. So you, several of you, when you picked up your schedule said, 
well, I, I'm not meeting with so-and-so, I've met with them for five years, and that's great, and we want you to do that, but we also want you to get in, some, in front of some members that maybe we haven't been seeing that are important to us, okay? Um, so we talked about the folder and the map of the teal, but one thing to keep in mind, too, on your schedule, so there's three house buildings, Rayburn, Longworth, and Cannon, and then on this end, and Hart. Um, the Capitol property is in the middle, the actual building, the visitor center is in the middle. If you've never been there before, it's pretty, it's not as daunting once you get it, okay? Um, absolutely ask for help. The best people to ask are the Capitol Hill police. And they hate it, they're like glorified tour guides, but it's the reality. So if you walk out of an office and you have eight minutes and you're like, uh, oh, I don't know which way to go, just to ask them. They're used to it. Now, I will say this. There are some that have the really big guns. Don't ask them. They're not as nice. So the ones with the handguns, they'll help you out, so ask them. Um, 945 is a very popular time for folks to be arriving onto the hill because 10 o'clock is a very popular committee hearing time. Now, tomorrow I don't, and I'm not sure if it's been mentioned yet, um, but the Prime Minister of Japan, have we talked about this yet, is on the Hill tomorrow for a joint session of Congress at 11. So this is phenomenal for um, those of us that aren't trying to schedule meetings. <laughs> so that basically means every member of Congress, for the most part, from 1045 to 1145 is going to be tied up in the Capitol building. Um, and I'll also mention that because they will have expanded security around the Capitol. So if you're used to walking out of Rayburn and just darting straight across to the Senate side, just know you might have to allow extra few minutes. And same thing in the morning, arriving to the Hill. If your first meeting's not until 11, you might want to arrive a few minutes earlier, plan in some time because there's going to be a motorcade to take in to consideration tomorrow morning. So there's a lot of other stuff going on over all the normal hearings and markups and votes and everything else that normally happens, we have the Prime Minister and all the stuff that normally happens in the morning is shifted to the afternoon. So just gonna have to be patient with that and keep that in mind. Um, if you're coming up to a, a building to go in in the morning and there's a long line, remember you can walk around the corner. All buildings have multiple entrances, so you don't have to stand behind the 250 school kids trying to go in, okay? So keep that in mind too. Um, lunch tomorrow will be on your own. Um, there's a cafeteria in the basement of almost every building, some nicer than others. Um, and this was mentioned, the Longworth Cafeteria Annex is where we will be. We'll have extra leave behind folders. If you have a question, if you need anything, if you just want to chat, if you want to tell us how your meetings are going, any of that, that's where we'll be throughout the day, so you'll be able to check in with us. Um, at 1.30 tomorrow, and this is on your schedule, we're going to be doing the group photo on the Capitol steps. Now, and I say that because the Prime Minister should be cleared out and everything should be back to normal by then. If for some reason it's not, one reason we were getting your cell phone numbers is because about 1 o'clock tomorrow I'll go check. If they still have the perimeter set up, you'll receive a text message from us on what the new time is. Okay. Unfortunately, I can't do anything about the weather, which is going to be beautiful. Thank you, I did. But, and I can't do anything about the Prime Minister or security, so um, we'll just have to, again, be flexible. Um, tomorrow, there's a lot of walking, um, and I know you know that, and we've said that, but it's a lot of walking on hard marble floors and it makes a difference. Um, so please wear comfortable shoes. It is perfectly acceptable, women, if you want to wear your comfortable shoes and have your cute shoes in your bag and pull them out in the hallway and put them on and swap them in and out. And if you go look at my bag, that's what I have too. So that's what we do here in DC, it's okay. Um, throughout the day, there's gonna be hearings, markups, votes called. If you hear the bell <coughs> ring, you'll, you know that votes are called. So go ahead and scoot on to the office so you can hopefully catch the member on the way out. If you're walking into an office and says, oh, I'm just going to vote, walk with me. Don't be like, oh, you're supposed to, just do it. Do it and pull out your cell phone, text one of us and say, okay, the congressman caught us, we're walking to the Capitol, I have no idea what's happening next. And just let us handle it. We'll figure out your schedule, we'll rearrange things, okay? Tomorrow's about enjoying the day and seizing a moment if like that happens. So don't be so strict to your schedule that you don't take advantage of it. Um, meetings for the most part are 15 minutes, give or take. Um, you can meet in the hallway, 
um, or you could spend 45 minutes in the congressman's office. We never know how it's going to go. On your schedule, if the member's name is listed first, that means right now you're planning on meeting with the member. If there's a staff level or a staff name listed first, you're meeting with the staff. You could walk through tomorrow, come back and say every single one of this was opposite from the way it was on the schedule, okay? So just, again, be flexible. If you're running late, you know, five, ten minutes late, just call the office directly. You have the number. Give them a call. Just let them know that you're running a few minutes late. Um, if you have a problem, then text us. Um, and I say texting because it seems to work better on the Hill than calling. So if for some reason you don't text, um, let us just drop by and let us know so we can note that so we're not trying to text you. Um, also, keep your phones on vibrate, but keep them on, just keep them on muted. Um, and another thing, some of you will have, whether it's the photographer or the, um, somebody from Holland and Knight or um, one of the NAMT leadership folks that will be joining you for meetings tomorrow. If you do, that says on your schedule. So if you think you're being efficient and getting to a meeting 15 minutes early, don't start that meeting until that person arrives won't necessarily know you're already in there. Um, if you have any questions, again, text us. Um, all members have Twitter handles. Um, the app, and there's more information at our table if you want it, but it's also on your schedule. Some mobile apps to, to download. If you tweet, um, this is phenomenal. It's Guys, it's such a great way tomorrow. When you walk out of the office, you know, or, or take a selfie, or even just tweet, you know, thanks to the member's name, you know, with their handle for meeting with us, you know, hashtag EMS on the Hill, and let's just blow it up tomorrow with that. It's great. And the members love, love that. You know, you might as well have written them a hand thank you note. You know, that's as much, that's, it's important to them. So they really, really appreciate that. Um, tomorrow's going to be awesome. It's going to be crazy. Who's, is this their first time? So that's awesome, that's great, and we are so glad you're here. But really, I'm not joking, wear comfortable shoes. If not, we have some Band-Aids we keep in Longworth, so we will find you and give them to you. But um, just be flexible tomorrow, be prepared, um, and be responsive. If, a, if an office says something to you, asks you a question you don't know, don't fib, don't make it up. Just say, you know what, somebody from NAMT will get back to you on that. Let us know so we can follow up, okay? So that's it. Have a great time. Have fun. I'm going to step back out in the hall. We'll be here all night if you have any questions or anything else from us, okay? Thank you, Lori. You know, D.C. is a town where there are pretty much in tune with non-discrimination. So just for you know equality's sake, gentlemen, if you want to wear your comfortable shoes and carry your cute ones, that's probably OK, too. It's now my great privilege to introduce Lisa Tofel. She's a uh, partner at the prestigious Holland and Knight Law Firm. She's our chief lobbyist on the field EMS bill. And you've probably made jokes about the, trying to tap the energy of your little kids and then sell it on the market. I've never seen such an energetic adult in my life. She is wonderful. We're so lucky to have her. And she's going to help us get ready to discuss the bill with our congressional leaders. Lisa? Hi. Um, it is my great privilege uh, to be up here. What you do every day compared to what I do every day um, is so meaningful. And it is the great honor for Miranda and I um, to try at the macro level to make what you do at the micro level easier and caring for your patients every single solitary day. Thank you so much for taking the time. We know that many of you are, are, are here at your own expense. Um, we as professional lobbyists, I'm even worse, I'm the dreaded double L, um, lawyer and lobbyist, <laughs> spend a lot of time on Capitol Hill, but they want to hear from you. Your representatives in your state want to hear from you, so thank you so much. 
Um, we are so excited, if you want to flip, about uh, the impending introduction um, of the field EMS bill. But to just to give you a quick context in terms of where we are on Capitol Hill. So has anyone ever heard of the doc fix before? Yeah, OK. It's done. We get to bury it. Um, it's never going to come back, that horrible, terrible, sustainable growth rate formula that for um, the entirety of Miranda's professional when she was working for physician groups, um, has plagued them, is done. The Congress just enacted, finally, after 14 years, repeal of the SGR. They replaced it with a new means by which to pay physicians. And uh, so that's, that's done. And we are thrilled about it because it sucked a lot of energy out of the healthcare space. Um, it provides a small increase to the physicians over a period of time. And one of the things that it does is it enables physicians to voluntarily, if they don't want to be in fee-for-service anymore, it enables them to undertake alternate uh, payment delivery models. And that's really important because one of the things that the field EMS bill does is the same thing. We sort of borrowed from as the Congress just enacted it. And of course, it includes uh, the ambulance add-on extenders for urban, rural, and super rural until January 1, 2018. It is around that time frame that there are a lot of other expiring health provisions that all come back. SGR won't be one of them, but we'll have lots else to do over the course of the next uh, couple of years. So now that SGR repeal is over, what does that mean? The House and Senate are currently working on the budget resolution. That's a technical word in Washington for a budget plan, budget blueprint. Um, the budget resolution or the budget plan doesn't have to be enacted by the Congress and signed by the President in the way that you think about laws. It just has to be agreed to between the House and the Senate, and that's what they're working on right now. And since both chambers are controlled by the Republican Party, we expect that they're going to get there. Uh, 21st century cures um, is the buzzword, so you may hear that. We wanted to make sure that you were aware of it. Um, the House Energy and Commerce Committee is going to have a hearing on 21st century cures um, on Thursday, and within the health space, it's after SGR, the fastest moving vehicle. Basically, what it is designed to do is to modernize the FDA approval process to spur innovation. Uh, to grossly oversimplify what's going to be a very large and substantial piece of legislation. But if you hear the word cures or the word 21st century cures legislation, that's what everybody's talking about. So just to be aware that that's out there. The other big thing that's out there, of course, is the King v. Burwell case. Anybody heard about this? Yeah, OK. Um, we are expecting a decision in the King v. Case on June 30th, uh, basically the last day of the session. It's a very busy session for the Supreme Court. And basically what it's going to do is determine whether or not the IRS was in its authority, had authority under the Affordable Care Act to provide subsidies, premium subsidies to individuals in states that did not create their own exchange marketplace. And um, since you're talking about you know, 34 states and um, ranging on the estimate uh, somewhere between seven to eight uh, or nine million people who are receiving subsidies in those states in which the federal exchange was created, it's pretty significant. The Republicans have said uh, that they have a, uh, a plan to create a bridge if that occurs, but it will certainly be very active here in Washington, D.C. if the Supreme Court decides against the administration. If it decides that the administration had authority, um, it'll be a little bit less quiet, but not in the reverse. So with that, I'll move on. Field EMS bill. So our sponsors uh, in the last Congress, and we anticipate Sponsors going forward are uh, Larry, cardiac surgeon from Indiana. Where are the folks from Indiana? Okay, awesome. Um, and uh, Dr. Heck uh, uh, from Nevada, and then Senator Crapo and Senator Bennett from Colorado. Um, the field EMS bill is the first major piece of legislation to address emergency medical services in the field in 30 years. It is a big bill. And we are very excited to let you know that we have been working to update the legislation. And, um, and the bill is going to be even bigger and better than ever. Emphasis on better, not bigger, because it actually isn't bigger. 
Um, but we expect uh, the legislation to be filed very soon, um, certainly within the coming weeks, hopefully sooner. Um, they are, the bill is at legislative council. What does that mean? It means that the congressional lawyers are still in the drafting it. And, um, and so the, our sponsors are making some final tweaks to the language, but the structure of it has all been decided upon. So if we can go to the next slide. So where did the field EMS bill come from? Um, you know, the Institute of Medicine had a report in 2006 that looked at emergency devices and said, oh, we got some problems. And they're significant problems, right? What did the IOM say? Uncertain quality of care, those are pretty scary words, limited evidence base, disparate response times, lack of professional identity uh, for EMS practitioners, not integrated into the healthcare system, sitting here over here as a silo, and fragmented. And definitely not consistent with the way health healthcare is going in terms of the triple aim, better costs, I mean lower costs, better quality, uh, and population health basis. So what is the solution? It is really to modernize the field EMS system into going from a 20th century transport model to a 21st century centered, integrated model of healthcare delivery that includes mobile integrated healthcare, community paramedicine, emergency medical response. To make it easier for you when you are doing your Hill Day meetings, going back to Pam's point, um, right along here, see the basics of what the bill does and I would very much encourage you to pull it out during your meetings because the most critical four things that the legislation is doing and then I'll get to the fifth is aligning federal leadership so that it's clear that the Secretary of Health and Human Services were clarified that she has leadership responsibility for emergency medical care across the spectrum she already has leadership responsibility for public health emergencies, right? So game day, so she needs to be responsible and clearly responsible for everyday care that's provided to patients with emergency medical conditions, including on game day. Um, innovation and quality, um, the bill goes further this year in terms of enabling the opportunity for EMS agencies to voluntarily participate in quality programs and uh, a new innovative payment model um, uh, so that if you want to, on a shared savings basis, um, you can do community paramedicine and get paid for it. You can do mobile integrated healthcare and get paid for it. So that's a, a big leap forward, and we're still finalizing that language. Modernizes EMS capability, including the establishment of an EMS preparedness program, similar to a hospital preparedness program, and integrates emergency medical care into the national health information uh, system and, and structure and it improves the evidence base of the care that you're providing by enabling greater level of research and focus on EMS research specifically in the field. Certainly the bill does not cost money. If you get asked that question tomorrow, it does not cost the federal government money because it has a self-financing mechanism where people can voluntarily contribute. And for all the money that is raised across this country in bake sales and everything else that you do to raise money, um, we have every confidence that we can raise the money uh, to support these critical programs. Oh, well, I just walked through that. So next. <laughs> That's it. Um, so I think Melissa's next in terms of the, the larger ask. Um, but what you're really doing is requesting co-sponsorship of the Field EMS Modernization Act. For those who had, um, it's marked on your sheet if you had a prior meaning someone who's already supported the legislation. And so if you see that little star um, on your sheet that says prior co-sponsor, please thank them and ask them to co-sponsor again. And if you're meeting with either, uh, if you're the Indiana crew, the Nevada crew, the Idaho Chris, you're, I know you're leading that group in Colorado, Bruce, um, of course, thank them for their leadership and support. And in terms of, um, uh, you know, the, the specific ask, um, ask people to co-sponsor the legislation um, that is uh, going to be introduced very soon by uh, both the, our Senate champions and our House champions. And with that, um, I will turn it back over to Melissa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa. Now we will move on to the two other asks that are in your um, packets. 
the EMS Caucus. The EMS Caucus is chaired by Representative Tim Walls of Minnesota, and this should only be an ask of your House representatives. We do not currently have a caucus on the Senate side. What the caucus will do is bring a more disciplined focus on EMS issues, form a more collective and cohesive bipartisan message on EMS issues, support EMS providers nationwide, and help promote education and increase awareness among decision makers on federal policy issues affecting EMS providers and gain congressional support for emergency medical and trauma care at the federal level, which is needed now more than ever. What we are requesting is that you ask all members of the U.S. House representatives who are not on the caucus, and if they are on the caucus, you will find that on your background information or talking points. Ask them to help promote emergency medical services and the life-saving care they deliver to all patients with emergency medical t conditions. Next, we will talk about the Veterans EMT Support Act. In 2012, approximately 10,000 combat medics, Navy corpsmen, and Air Force medical technicians were trained. There are now 40,000 medics serving in the Army, the Guard, and in the Reserves. According to a recent Bureau of Labor Statistics occupational outlook, there will be 55,000 new civilian EMT and paramedic jobs created between 2012 and 2000. To help with the military to civilian medic transition, two bills have been introduced. The Senate Bill S-453 is sponsored by Senator Bill Cassidy of Louisiana. And H.R. 1818 is sponsored by Representatives Adam Kinzinger of Illinois and Luis Capps of California. These bills seek to establish a demonstration program for states with a shortage of EMTs, to streamline state requirements and procedures and assist veterans who completed military EMT training to meet state EMT certification, licensure, and other requirements. Identifying methods such as waivers for military EMTs to forego or meet any such equivalent state requirements and to offset costs through existed funding programs. What we are requesting our Senate and our House representatives support military medics transitioning to civilian EMS by becoming a co-sponsor of the Veteran Emergency Medical Technician Support Act of 2000, S-453 and H.R. 1818. Also, um, we have been invited to take a picture with Senator and um, Representative Kinzinger. So if you are currently an active military veteran or military instructor, there will be a photo opportunity tomorrow at 4.30 on um, Capitol Hill on the Senate side East Steps. And we invite you to attend if it works in your schedule. This is not mandatory, but if you would like to join us, please do so. And there going out with all of that information and details. I will now turn the um, podium back to Pam. As Lori mentioned, um, you've been seated um, with table numbers that represent your state delegation group. This is the group that this is your team, um, and your team will will go on all the visits um, to your um, to your members of Congress um, to, to each of their offices. So, please, before you leave this room tonight, make sure that you know everybody in your de delegation. Get their cell phone numbers. Um, talk to everybody, um, figure out you know, where you're going to meet in the morning, um, and really look at each of these bills and maybe decide um, who's going to be the lead person in making the presentation to your members of Congress. Um, the more you're prepared 
for your visits tomorrow, the more successful your visits are going to be. So please be sure um, that you, you know, stick around after the formal program is over and really uh, work with your delegation members to make sure that you're all set for tomorrow. Uh, to also help you, we're going to run some scenarios. You're all familiar with EMS scenarios. So we're going to do some congressional scenarios that kind of show you what you might encounter on Capitol Hill. Um, for those of you who have done this before, you know you have to be flexible. There's all different um, scenarios that you're going to encounter. Um, and so we have some um, volunteers um, who will be helping us with the scenarios. So the first scenario is the scenario of the very busy congressional leader. And Dr. Brent Myers will be coming up to uh, serve as our member of Congress. And our lobbyist, um, Lisa Tofel and Miranda Franco, will be um, our Hill attendees who will be making the presentation. Hey, the scene safe. <laughs> <laughs> Let's ask Congressman Myers about that if the scene is safe. <laughs> Not yield the time for the gentleman from Oregon. That's for sure. <laughs> do I need to do it that microphone so they can hear us? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think we need to. Right. Are, are these on? Can you hear if we're here? I'm trying to do this without killing each other. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a little tight. All right. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Great. Nice have, to meet you, Congressman. Nice I have got you. to go to a vote in like 30 seconds. The offices are all full. If we could just talk. Fantastic. So yes. thank you so much. Congressman, appreciate your time very much. I'm Lisa Tofel from your district. I'm an EMT, provide emergency medical services, and this is my colleague, Miranda Franco. I'll see you in your district and provide life saving services to your constituents every well, day. Well, that's great. Thank so, you so much for Congressman, what you do. Congressman, we're here. We want to talk about the field EMS bill. We know you're having to move very quickly, but we wanted to let you know that it's about to be reintroduced. And, um, and we would very much like for you to co-sponsor it. It is moving emergency medical services provided to patients with life-threatening conditions at times from a 20th century model of transport only to a 21st century model of mobile well, That sounds fascinating. Healthcare. I've got a member of my staff here. If you can do that, I've really got to get we the We will floor. absolutely do that. Thank you. Will you take a look at the legislation when it's in? We'll take a look at the legislation with Great. I we're, promise you I will. We hope we can count on your support. Thank you, Congressman. Okay. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Got to go. Bars up. I mean, the. <laughs> <laughs> so that was our first scenario. The second scenario is the scenario of the staff interrogator. Okay. So as. Lori mentioned you might go into a situation where the member of Congress is off at a hearing, but you have the staff person who may or may not be that friendly, may or may not be having a good day, okay, and decide that they want to drill you on all the aspects of the bill. So um, helping us with this is going to be Asbel Montes from Acadian Ambulance, and he's going to um, help us with this scenario. Hi, Asbel, so nice to meet you. I'm Lisa Tofal. Hi, I'm Asbel Montez. I'm a paramedic from your district. Oh, fantastic. Oh, I, think, I think we switched scenarios because I'm going to be staff. Oh, you're staff? Yes. I just want to really pretend that I'm staff for once in my life. Okay. So. Oh, 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 oh. I want to interrogate. Oh, 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 I'm always interrogated. We were trying to sorry. figure out what our roles were. I'm starting my bossiness even before the roles start. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Hi, Miranda Franco, so nice to meet you. Lisa Tofel, I'm a paramedic from your district. Great, nice I'm to meet Asma you. I'm Montez, an EMT from your district. Great, why don't you all have a seat? Great, thank you. So I just have like five minutes and my boss has co-sponsored this before, so if you could just dive in right away and just tell me what's different about this version. Great, and we thank you so much. Can you hear? Yes. yes. Okay. Never been accused of being quiet. Um, uh, we thank you so much for your leadership and your willingness to co-sponsor. Um, we expect the bill to be introduced pretty soon and we it's gone through an update and we've spent um, some time working with our sponsors so it, it, they're just that we wanted to update you on and we really appreciate your co-sponsorship I'm gonna interject real quick so last time after y'all came in my boss sponsored the bill fire unions and they do not love this bill can you tell me why that is and and why we shouldn't worry about that and, and continue to co-sponsor this bill absolutely um uh, and we, we just respectfully disagree very mm -hmm. much uh, the fire union, um, but we have a different perspective. We view emergency medical services as 
medical services first and foremost. And as a result, it, the services that are provided to patients with emergency medical conditions need to be integrated into the rest of the healthcare system. That can only be done at the Department of Health and Human Services. So one of the concerns that they raised was recognition of, they don't support recognition of HHS um, in terms of the lead federal agency for emergency medical services. And, and let me just give you a few key pieces of information with regard to that. First of all, the Secretary of Health and Human Services is already designated by the Congress as the lead for medical response to public health emergencies, basically catastrophic health events. She's already tasked with that responsibility. She's also already tasked with the responsibility for the Medicare program, the Medicaid program, and the Children's Health Insurance program. So in light of all of that, it's not possible for her to be responsible for leading game day if she's not responsible for every day. So the legislation clarifies um, that the Secretary of Health and Human Services is responsible for routine emergency medical care so that she can fulfill her other functions. So we're not sure whether that's going to improve uh, the perspective of the fire union in terms of how they look at it, but we think that that's important for patients. Okay, so what else has changed in the bill from last session? Well, one of the things that's changed in the bill is that we've really focused the EMS uh, grant program on preparedness. I'm give that to you there too, that kind of there's a hospital preparedness program that exists right now, but there is no preparedness program for EMS agencies. And so you're so, saying there's no, there's no program and there's no funding that's going to EMS. There is no funding and no program. So um, we've updated the legislation. So what was the equip program in the last bill is EMS similar to hospital preparedness. So it fills a very important, mm -hmm. important gap. And then, Aspel, do you want yeah, to talk a little bit yeah, about reimbursement? Actually, and absolutely. There's actually two models that is a voluntary. So it's actually innovative models for transport for alternate transport delivery models that is it to quality payments as well for any shared savings <coughs> that may be within that transport destination model as well. And are you guys doing that now? Is that something that you have experience to do and the capability to do? Um, actually, yes, with NEMS we do, but right now under the old 20th century, what we're what kind of in the 20th century model, um, it actually only pays us to transport to a hospital. Innovative delivery models, and it's actually voluntary to any um, ambulance organization that wants to do that or EMS organization that would like to do that um, to actually look at alternative destination models. And then, if there are some savings from that, that actually will be tied to quality payments as well. This sounds like it might be expensive. What is this going to cost? Absolutely nothing. How, how is that possible? Because as you recall from the last bill, um, it has a self-financing mechanism. So it creates an EMS trust fund and people or individual taxpayers are able to voluntarily contribute to the trust fund. Um, sort of Do you like think they did. That sounds a little gimmicky to me. Do at you the think? height of the presidential trust fund, it was bringing in 60, 70, 80 million dollars a year. And that was for a presidential campaign. Um, so given the success of our community in, in bake sales and raising money um, for basics on our, our ambulances every day, we think that we're happy to take responsibility for raising that money. So we're not uh, asking the taxpayers to pay. And in fact, we think that the shared savings program that ASMO was talking about that enables us to branch into innovative models and not take every patient to the hospital that doesn't need to go to the hospital and can get care a different way, we think that's going to produce savings for the federal government and that can be plowed back into helping us, you know, achieve the highest level of quality care that we can. Okay, well I love things that don't cost money and improving quality. So if my boss wants to go back onto this bill, who should he contact? Who's who's the sponsor of this bill? Um, uh, since you're in the House of Representatives, the sponsor would be Teresa Buckley in Representative Bouchon's office. And in the Senate, it would be uh, Kelly McConnell with Senator Crapo. Okay, great. Well, I'll talk to my boss about this and see if we can get back on. Great, Thank thanks. You. Can I follow up with you in a couple weeks, you know, as the bill gets introduced, just to make sure that you're aware of the introduction and, uh, and make sure that you've had the opportunity to take a look and answer any questions. That'd be great. Great, I'll follow up with you in a couple weeks. Great. Thank you so much, Thank Miranda. You. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Miranda. Thank you. you okay, so just to, like, the follow-up is really important, particularly for the introduction of the legislation. 
And so you're going to want to just tell them you're going to circle back around in two weeks, and it's the best way. On Capitol Hill, persistence is, um, is a really good thing, as long as it's not pesky. It's appreciated. And we have one more scenario that you might encounter, and this is a scenario of a staff person who might not be real interested in what you've got to say, so it's going to be how do you capture the attention of this uninterested staff person. We'd like to invite Rob Lucrist, um, NAMT board member, from New Jersey who's going to come up and has kindly allowed us to use him as our uninterested staff person. Hi, great. Nice to meet you, Lisa Hi, Great. I'm a paramedic from your state providing do you want, services. Do you want to have a seat? Trenton. That'd be great. Thank you. And likewise, I'm also practicing in your in your state, and we're so excited to be here. Thanks for your time. Great. Thanks for coming. So, are you familiar at all with the field EMS bill? I'm, I'm sorry. What, what was that? Are you familiar at all with the field EMS bill or uh, field no, EMS I'm not, in general? Not at all. Um, have you or a loved one ever had to utilize EMS services? Oh, just one second. My, my, my daughter's just gotten a fight in school. Oh, maybe she needs an ambulance. We can help Oh, I hope that. not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we were just hoping to take a few moments of your time to talk about the field EMS bill and just tell you how it can help your constituents and our patients to really high quality and move from sort of an old model of just transport to really providing comprehensive care. Um, and there's sort of, we have a little infographic that I'd be happy to sort of walk you through that shows you some of the components. But a big piece of this is that field EMS is sort of fragmented in terms of who oversees it. And as you know, as a staffer, this is all really siloed. So we want to clarify who's working on this at HHS and make sure this falls under the scope of the secretary. You know, this of expertise. I'm, I actually specialize in transportation. So my, my colleague that does healthcare wasn't available, but, but I'd be happy to bring something back to them. Well, since we're sitting in front of you and since we traveled for the meeting, if we could just take a few more minutes of your time and then you could perhaps relay the information to your health staff or your colleague and we'll, we'll happily follow up with them as well. Sure. Is that okay? Yes. Great through just a few other components of the bill. So this would clarify that HHS is the lead for emergency so as you know, the secretary sort of oversees some of the big day pieces of emergency medical care, but not the everyday. So this would clarify that she would oversee every facet of that. It also helped drive quality through some quality innovation mechanisms, and then the grants would help provide seed funding to these programs that, as you may know, are doing literally, you know, bake sales, put gas in their rigs. Sure. So we want to ensure that they have the, sure. the capital that they need, and most importantly, they would be of no cost, which we know in this fiscal environment, it's really important that we, that there's government, so we would offset this all through an EMS trust fund. Great. That would be through voluntary contributions, mm -hmm. through, through tax dollars. So we think it's a really kind of simple bill in the terms of modernizing our system, and we'd really love your boss's support. Is that something you think he would be willing to do? You know, like I said, I'd, I'd have to bring it back to him, but I'm happy to bring it back to my colleagues, and we, we can see from there. That'd be great. great. We'd love to follow up. Oh, can please. you tell us the name of your health care staff person so we can also follow up after you've had the opportunity to? Sure. It's Pam Lane. Oh, <laughs> great. Okay. Fabulous. Well, we'll be happy to follow up with Pam afterward, and we'll also let the folks at NEMT know so that their lobbyists can also follow up and provide some additional information as okay. well. Okay. Great. Thanks for coming. Appreciate so, it. So, thanks. We appreciate your time mm -hmm. and your interest. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Just want to thank, want to give a, a good hand to all of our um, volunteer actors. Thank you. And now we're going to have Bruce Evans come up for our um, Field EMS Advocate of the Year Award. Thanks, Pam. I got to find my spot here. So, um, as I was looking around the room, and uh, many of you I've met in my travels, and uh, some of the other advocates that have been in the states, I'm um, I'm very encouraged with what we've accomplished here. Um, we've got Senate introduction last year, which was a big step, and we also have what's considered to be record attendance for the EMS Day on the Hill tomorrow. So, give yourself a big round. So our advocacy efforts have already opened the eyes to federal and state legislators about how important EMS is to our community and to the nation. 
Our work on the EMS field bill has been very successful. Uh, the bill stands to help advance EMS both, both beyond anything that we've seen in our lifetime. It, uh, it'll provide some resources for training. It'll provide uh, some research and some much needed equipment. It'll also um, look to help with some job training. It'll pr by progressing with this bill towards its eventual passage, it's no small feat. And it's that uh, it takes a lot of grassroots efforts. So what we did is we created this uh, EMS Field Bill Advocate Award, and we, we'll be awarding those, or we have those to give to uh, three individuals tonight. It's a national award that recognizes the professionals for their outstanding volunteer efforts to pass this bill. So it's my uh, privilege to announce these recipients this year, and if you'd hold your applause until they're called up to the podium here. Our first recipient this year is Dr. Ratu Sani. Many of you know Dr. Ratu Sani. He's been a driving force in promoting the EMS field bill. He's published a lot of articles, building consensus in the EMS physician community. He's also worked with the Oregon EMS Association to secure some of our US House of Representative co-sponsors from Oregon and one from California. Dr. Sani is a physician from the Portland area. He's the medical director for Lake Oswego Fire Department and the associate medical director for the Clackamas County EMS system. He also practices emergency medicine at the Providence Portland Medical Center. Dr. Sani served as the president of the National Association of EMS Physicians from 2013 to 2013. And now he's the NAMSP executive chair on their advocacy committee. His career includes being the medical director for the Oregon State EMS system. He's uh, held several committees that have involved with either uh, research or the analysis of the EMS Advisory Council. And he's been a board member for the National Registry of EMTs. So if you'd welcome and give a round of applause to Dr. Siani. Hey, buddy. So our next advocate of the year is Tim. Tim was instrumental in obtaining the support of Senator Bennett's co in the in the Senate. He's uh, Tim's made some great strides in engaging our local our local uh, constituents in Colorado and many of the EMS practitioners that have been in our congressional delegation. Tim's the chief executive officer and the paramedic for the Ute Pass Regional Ambulance Service just outside of uh, Colorado Springs in Woodland Park, Colorado, a service that he started in 2000 under the name of the Woodland Park Ambulance Service. Tim serves on the board, uh, the Colorado Emergency Medical, so, uh, Service, Emergency Medical Services Association, MSAC, and he's the president of the Chiefs, Managers, and Directors Group. We're very fortunate in the state of Colorado to actually have a very active group of EMS managers and directors that are actively engaged in our uh, congressional or our state uh, legislature and also with our governor. Uh, Tim uh, has been an advocate at, na at the national level. He's been here at the EMS Day on the Hill since I can remember, and it's been a great time with him. Please uh, give some applause to Tim Deans. <laughs> One more. Tim. Tim. <laughs> and our, our last recipient, and this, uh, this man has done a, a phenomenal job. He's, uh, our final recipient is going to be Keith Douglas. And Keith is credited and appreciated for bringing one of the largest contingencies to EMS Day on the Hill from the great state of Tennessee. He's, uh, he's as an NAMT advocacy coordinator from Tennessee, Keith has dedicated himself to raising awareness of the field EMS bill to both EMS practitioners and legislators in his state. Keith has had a variety of positions in his 20 years at the Sumner County EMS, most recently serving as the director there. Before that, he worked at the Hendersonville Police Department and the Department of Transportation for the state of Tennessee. His qualifications include administrator, he's also been an EMS administrator, an EMT, a paramedic, and he's a firefighter three. 
He served his community with the same diligence that he's shown and the same professionalism that he's shown in advocating for the field EMS bill. So please uh, give a round of applause to Keith and Okay, and I'll turn the podium back over to our president, Chuck Kearns. Congratulations once again to our 2015 Field EMS Bill recipient, Award recipients. Once again, thank you everyone for your participation. Now, the moment you've all been waiting for, for those of you who are here, I can't say this for those of you who are at home watching us. Please enjoy a drink and some snacks. While you mingle and network with each other, we look forward to the grand EMS presence tomorrow up on the hill. And to those who enjoyed us, joined us by video, thank you very much. Everybody have a wonderful evening and a great day on the hill tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.